think this is somewhere in the text as well in the book. Those are my disclosures. And so today what I'd like to do is really give an overview about the immune system, how the immune system works, gets activated, and identify the different populations associated with prognosis in ovarian cancer. I'd also like to go into some of the strategies that we should be thinking about if we're designing clinical trials for ovarian cancer down the road. So just by way of introduction, I've got this slide, and I'm happy to take questions as I go along as well, because I think um, we all have a different background, and I think it's important to really get a grasp of all these different populations that I'm talking about today. So on the far left, we have the blue cell, which is a key cell called an dendritic cell, or an antigen-presenting cell. And this cell is the one that really initiates the immune response. And so what it does, as the name suggests, is it takes whatever antigen is of interest at the time and it displays it on the surface of the dendritic cell. And we have to keep in mind that this is always in the context of HLA molecules or the major histocompatibility complex molecules. So what happens is um, the MHC molecules, MHC class 1, for example, really samples the peptides within the cell and, and brings these peptides on the surface in, the com in combination with the MHC molecules. So we can think of this as like a hot dog, right? And, and the peptide is sitting in the groove of the bun, basically. And this is what the T cell is seeing. And I just want to spend a little bit of time coming back to this because when we now talk about, everybody's talking about mutation burden and how that has something to do with the driving the immune response. There's one thing that people don't, don't think about, and this is the whole process of antigen presentation. So I'm going to come back to this in a second. I want to explain the other cells and then really talk a little bit about this because actually people don't think about the connections that have to go on when we're inducing an immune response in the case of cancer. Okay, so we got this key cell, the dendritic cell on the left, and it's presenting antigen, and in the case of anti-tumor immunity, it's presenting a tumor-specific peptide to two cell populations. One is a purple one, which is a CD4 positive cell, which is a helper cell population, and the other one's a CD8 positive cell, which is a cytotoxic cell. And when either the CD4 or the CD8 cell sees antigen on the dendritic cell, what happens is it goes on, it, the signals go through the T cell receptor, cells proliferate, acquire effective function, and if it's tumor specific, they find their way to the tumor, which I have on the far right. Okay, all of this is regulated by a cell known as a regulatory cell in yellow, and this cell acts to inhibit or just regulate the immune response just so that it doesn't get too overzealous, okay, and cause autoimmunity or something like that. So regulatory T cells are key, but they act at different levels. They act at right on the helper cell, which is the CD4 positive cell again. They act right on the CD8 cell, the cytotoxic cell. They also have the capacity to act on the dendritic cell, but they are found in the tumor microenvironment, as I have on the right. And again, if the regulatory cell is found there, it's usually a bad prognosis. You don't want to have too many of these inhibitory cells there blocking the anti-tumor response at the site of the uh, uh, tumor. So what's not talked about a lot is everybody says, okay, great, we've got these mutations, and mutation burden really correlates with the magnitude of the response and the ability of patients to respond, say, to pembrolizumab or any PD-1 blockade, right? So the problem is, okay, this is, and nobody talks about this, how do you get, it's the, mut the tumors, the guys on the far right that are expressing the mutations. And if you're gonna induce an anti-tumor response, those guys on the far right that express the mutations, that mutation has to land in the dendritic cell to initiate the whole response. Okay, so that is a really important puzzle about anti-tumor immunity that nobody really thinks about. You've gotta put the pieces together. Okay, so you've got a tumor expressing a mutation. You want to induce an immune response against that mutation. What's gonna have to happen is that the protein that's expressing the mutation on the tumor has to be engulfed by the antigen presenting cell. That little peptide that's holding that mutation or expresses that mutation has to find its way on the MHC molecule. First of all, normally not all peptides bind to the MHC molecule, okay? So this protein has to be chopped up into little pieces. That one little bit that expresses the mutation has to land in the MHC molecule and then has to be presented on the surface of the dendritic cell to activate either a cytotoxic or a helper T cell response. Okay, and that is by far the limiting thing that nobody really thinks about. Okay, so we have to appreciate that the whole 
way the immune system is working is it's really actually quite difficult to get a mutation specific anti-tumor response. So I just want to make everybody a little bit more skeptical about this whole idea about generating mutation specific T cells. It's really not that easy. Okay? Okay. So made that point. That's all we need to know. <laughs> <laughs> so um, but back to ovarian cancer. So why are we excited about immunotherapy in ovarian cancer? It's because um, there's really a lot of signs out there that says, it hints that it, this is going to work, immunotherapy in the context of ovarian cancer. And this is a very early study done by George Kukos's group, uh, published back in 2003. And what they showed is that the presence of tumor cells correlates with good prognosis. So you can see on the on the right here or on the left, um, this, the patients that have a lot of intratumor T cells just by immunohistochemistry do a lot better than the ones that don't have a lot of T cells. And so again, really suggesting that the immune response is going to play an important role in, in um, mounting an anti-tumor response. So Brad Nelson has done a, a very nice job at really dissecting and looking a little bit more carefully at what populations really need to be associated with good prognosis in ovarian cancer. And here he's, he's shown that he's looked at really various combinations of different cells, whether or not you need the helper cells, the cytotoxic T cells, and B cells all together. And it, do these things all together really correlate with a better prognosis? And that's what the answer is. You can see when he looks carefully, you can see the green line. If you have all these different cell populations in the tumor microenvironment, those patients do a lot better. Um, than the ones that, that don't have all those cell populations. So again, looking like immune therapy will really be a, a promising avenue for um, ovarian cancer. This is, um, I, I took this from a, a paper which is by Curiel et al. in Nature Medicine. This is asking the question, um, how important are the regulatory cells? So those were the inhibitory population that I showed in yellow in, at first. And this is one of the more extreme cases, but what they did was they looked in uh, stage four high-grade serous cancer, and they showed that if you have a lot of regulatory T cells, uh, the overall survival is, is fairly poor, whereas if, if you don't have a lot, which is on the far left, um, uh, you, 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 well, anyway, you can see on the slide, um, the prognosis correlates with the amount of regulatory cells that are found in the tumor microenvironment. So I'd like to go over just a little bit about um, the, the approaches that are used today is really the immune checkpoint inhibitors. I'm sure very, most of you are very familiar with this, um, but for those of you who are not, it's, it's really um, a, a gymnastics between a lot of different molecules that are expressed on the surface of both the T cells and antigen presenting cells. So the antigen presenting cell or the dendritic cell is in blue and the bottom is the T cell and I'd like to introduce a lot of the players that are involved in the communication during T cell activation. So the key one is the T cell receptor which is in the middle and it recognizes the peptide presented by the HLA molecule. And on the left, we have the two most studied, what we call co-stimulatory and co-inhibitory molecules. And this is CD28, which is a co-stimulatory molecule, binds to both B71 and B72, and CTLA4, which is an inhibitory molecule, I'm sure all of you know, um, which also binds to the same ligands, B71 and B72. So this whole, um, if you think about T cell activation and the regulation of activation, it's all going to be whether or not these guys are competing, they actually competitively bind to both B71 and B72. So the inhibitory and the activating co-stimulatory, co-inhibitory ligands are competitively binding uh, these molecules. So you have to think about T cell activation also in the, the kinetics point of view. So when are these molecules on? It, it's not completely a black and white thing, okay? If you go on the other side, we have PD-1, which is the other very uh, popular co-inhibitory molecule. Everybody's trying to block this interaction. But PD-1 binds to two ligands as well, um, with various names. We'll say PD-L1 and PD-L2. And the way the immune system works, I would be very surprised if it's not equally complicated, OK? So what I mean by that is um, I would be I would like to predict that we have a negative, sig negative signal going through here, PD-1, to these two, but I would be surprised if there wasn't another one that counteracts CD-28 that we just haven't discovered yet, 
okay? That probably competitively binds to these things. So what I want to say, the point I want to make is that there's actually very many B7-1 family members that have been described. There are up to seven or eight right now, but we really don't know a lot about them. So we're at a very interesting stage in the history of immunotherapy where um, the clinical responses to different drugs have actually, um, they're happening, we're all very excited about it, but the basic science is still somewhat lagging behind now because there's a lot of things we don't understand about how these all molecules engage other molecules. And so I've only got a few on, the, uh, on my slide here, but I can say there's really orders of tens, tens of fift to 50 molecules like this that are regulating activation versus inhibition. Okay. The other slightly complicated thing is that PDL1 is not only expressed on the antigen presenting cells, but they're also expressed by the tumor. So we actually, even though everybody's saying, you know, the, we think we understand how PD1 blockade is working, I don't think so because there's, there's the complexity of the whole biology is, is actually complex. <laughs> there's no way to uh, get around that. So um, there's a lot of things going. We have to think about where are these molecules being expressed, what's the timing, and all the different cell populations that are expressing it. So I can say the, the slide that I showed before, PD-1 is on CD4 cells, CD8 cells are on regulatory T cells, and nobody has even appreciated the contribution of adding PD-1 and the consequences of putting PD-1 on on how it affects regulatory T cells. Okay, so I just want to stand here to say and, and say we are so excited about PD-1, but we actually don't even know what cells are expressing it, and both PD-1 and the ligand PDL1 in the whole biology of, of, of the treatment and, and um, yeah, the response. There's a, there's a lot of work still to do. So I'm highlighting here in one paper um, histology with one particular antibody that was generated by Hamanishian and their colleagues. And so what you see here is some of the heterogeneity when we're looking at PDL1 expression in the ovarian cancer setting. So here's um, samples, examples of where uh, we get PDL1 high expression, intermediate and low expression. But I can say it can look completely different also if you just really look at immune cells that are only expressing PDL1. So here's an example where the tumor is expressing it, but there's also many examples where just the immune cells are expressing PDL1 as well. When this particular group did their study, they showed a correlation between PDL1 expression and the prognosis. So here we're looking at overall survival again, and those tumors that express PDL1 at high levels do poorly. Now, in, in comparison, um, this is some of the uh, data that has come out from studies from other uh, indications. So melanoma, there's approximately 38% response rate. Um, Non-small cell lung cancer, 17 and all the way down. But I think what everybody's excited about is that there's so many different cancers that are responding to PDL1 blockade or PD1 blockade. Uh, in ovarian cancer, um, there's been several studies. This is just a handful of them, but generally speaking, between 15% to 20, maybe 20% 20 of uh, ovarian cancers are responding to PD1 blockade. Early studies done. Um, with nivolumab, not, not this particular one that I have on the slide here, but there were 17 patients treated and two had responded. Um, and uh, that study was done by uh, uh, Julie Brommer. And this is, this is other data that's showing everything's in, in approximately the same uh, ballpark. One slide, uh, one cell population I'd like to introduce that um, also has not been well studied is what we call is the myeloid-derived suppressor cells. And these cells are, um, as the name suggests, uh, inhibitory. They're of the myeloid lineage, and they're found really in very many cancers. Uh, here I've got the tumor microenvironment, and I've got my myeloid-derived suppressor cell in green, but the idea is that the myeloid-derived suppressor cells really secretes a lot of inhibitory factors, one being IDO, uh, the other is, uh, um, yeah, arginase I've got on the bottom. It's, it's really involved in a lot of the biology, including matrix and remodeling, but the whole idea, um, I, I outlined in the next slide really that IDO is involved in tryptophan metabolism. I don't know how many um, people have come across this particular uh, mechanism, but it is, it is 
Um, IDO is a rate limiting step in the production of tryptophan. So what happens if IDO is high is that tryptophan gets depleted in the microenvironment. And the depletion of tryptophan is actually very immune inhibitory. So T cells need this in the microenvironment to proliferate. And if it's not there, they just don't do as well. They just get a little tired. And so in that way, it's immune inhibitory because it's, it's actually the consequence of having high IDO is having poor T cell function. And so when studies have been done asking the question, um, how do patients do with IDO? If they have um, high IDO levels, they actually do quite poorly, which is the lower dotted line. And, and the ones that don't have very much IDO, which is negative or just a little bit positive for IDO, they do much better. So when we were looking in this particular study uh, that was published in 2009, um, they found that IDO was expressed in 50% of serous endometrioid mucinous and clear cell tumors, and that if it's high, again, uh, T cells were generally lower, the, the good T cells, the CD8 positive T cells. Um, how's my time? Uh, eight, eight minutes ish. Okay. Okay, thanks. So I'd like to introduce another population of cells. Um, in, in the immune system, which is called the innate immune cells. And so I've already introduced the dendritic cells or the macrophages that are the key antigen-presenting cells, but there's another subset called innate lymphoid cells, and that's diagrammed on the bottom box. And the feature of these uh, particular cells, the reason why they're called innate lymphoid cells is it's known that they don't have the rearranging antigen receptors that B cells and T cells have. So they don't have the capacity to specifically recognize antigen, but they're very key in, in acting in the early stages of the immune response. And so these innate lymphoid cells, so what acting means is that, of course, the, the top guys present the antigen, but these other ones are important for generating cytokines and, and skewing the type of immune response that ensues after the presentation or during the presentation of the antigens. And so on the bottom, we have this innate lymphoid cells, and it's kind of a, this is a, an up-and-coming population. I'd say they've gotten really, really popular in the last five years. Immunologists have just started to explore their function and that, that they're even present in, in various situations in guiding the immune response. And so this is all, I would say, very up in the air right now, but right now, it's ca they are categorized as having uh, three groups of these cells. Um, the natural killer cells, which are known to actually also kill tumors, are part of group one, and the reason why they're part of group one is because they're all known to make a cytokine, cytokine called interferon gamma. There's two other groups of the innate immune cells, group two and three, also defined by the cytokines that are being produced. And this particular group, as, as I mentioned quickly, really is their, their general role is to produce cytokines. They can also kill tumor cells, the NK cells, but they also act as, as a regulatory cell because of the cytokines they produce that really skews the type of immune response that's being activated. And to give an example of how important these cells are in biology, um, we were very surprised to make this finding that was published back in 2012. Um, we were studying a virus model, and this virus model is called LCMV clone 13, lymphocytic choriomeningitis virus clone 13. And this particular virus strain is known to establish a chronic viral infection. So there's something special about it that the immune response cannot clear the virus and it just establishes itself as a chronic chronic infection. And so that's what's shown on the top slide. Uh, uh, in this case, mice get infected with the virus, activate uh, helper cells, cytotoxic T cells, but not very well, and so this is really established as a chronic infection. What we found was that if we took out the natural killer cells from a mouse, um, we actually got a very good cytotoxic response and a helper cell response, so that's at the bottom, and it was so good that the infection was cleared. So this is actually showing the natural killer cells have the capacity to, to define whether a chronic infection happens or not. So they're really, really regulating the intensity or the magnitude of the immune response. And so in, in the normal case when they're present, uh, we know that they actually kill the cytotoxic T cells, they can kill the helper cells, they actually call the, the population that's responding, limit the response, and that's why chronicity is, is happening. Okay, so I want to say, Long story short, this is happening also in ovarian cancer. We've come across a population that we call innate lymphoid cells that can also regulate the strength of the immune response. And so we were really excited to find this in, in ovarian cancer, and um, um, I'll just spend the next few slides explaining how we found this. 
Okay, so um, we were interested in uh, TIL therapy, so therapy for ovarian cancer using tumor infiltrating lymphocytes. And one of the things that if you, if you want to establish this as a, as a potential way uh, to treat patients, you want to ask the question, if we take uh, tumor samples, can we actually grow tumor infiltrating lymphocytes from these uh, samples? And so ideally, if we're thinking about immunotherapy, we want to have a certain number of cells with a certain period, within a certain period of time so we could treat patients with the cell population. And so what we did was we really evaluated this is, um, the number of cells we can grow in culture over time, and this is between 20 to 40 days. And we want, again, a certain cell number, and we're looking at more or less rapidly growing cells versus slow growing cells. And so we found that there was uh, several cultures that grew fine, and uh, the vast majority of cells grew fine. But these guys down here, they didn't really grow fine. The, the gray or the blues didn't grow at all. And we asked the question whether there was any difference in the cultures that grew well and, or didn't grow well. Very simple, straightforward question. And we found that the presence of CD56 cells, natural killer cells, or these innate lymphoid cells actually looked like they were inhibitory. So again, uh, here, the, the cultures where we did not see expansion of the tills, we found that there was a lot of NK cells. So each one of these bars is a culture. And you can see that there's quite a nice correlation that could be good or bad. I suppose it's actually not a good thing, but there's clear correlation between um, the presence of these CD56 positive cells and the ability of these T cells to grow in culture. If there wasn't very many of them, the T cells grew well. If there was a lot of them, the T cells did not grow well. And so this really led us to ask the question, are they inhibitory in, in ovarian cancer? And this is high-grade ca serous cancer. And these studies were done by both Sarah Crome and Lynn Nguyen. And Long story short, the answer is yes, they were inhibitory. So if on the left, we're looking at uh, fold expansion of the cells, if we take away the uh, CD56 positive cells, uh, the cells expanded better, but if they were still present in culture, they didn't expand as well. And we could do another assay to ask the question whether this, this population was inhibitory. Uh, we do this by taking the tills, uh, labeling them with a dye so we could follow how many times they divided stimulating the cells with really what's conventional uh, T-cell stimulatory um, antibodies, CD3 and 28, and adding back the CD56 positive potential inhibitory cells. And when we measured proliferation, we could see that the, in the absence of the inhibitory cells, the CD56 positive cells, there was no suppression, but when we added the CD56 positive cells back, there was a lot more suppression. So they inhibited the proliferation of the tumor infiltrating T-cells. And I'll just go to the next slide, which then shows what we did was we asked the question, um, do these, does this at all correlate with uh, disease recurrence in these patients? So if we took patients and we grew their tills and we knew that they had this inhibitory population, did these patients do worse or better? So turns out if the patients had uh, these inhibitory cells in their till cultures, they did much worse. So their time to recurrence was 12 months. If they did not have these cells in the, in the culture, so again, they would have come from the tumor microenvironment because we started with the surgical samples. If they were not present, um, the patients relapsed after approximately 23 months. So there was a one-year difference between the relapse rate, whether or not we could find these inhibitory populations in, in the T-cell cultures. Okay, so summary, I didn't go over all of these points. Uh, we recently published this study in Nature Medicine in, at, in March. And with this study and studying really surgical specimens coming uh, right fresh to the lab and, and then growing the tills, what we could show was we identified a unique population of regulatory cells that we're calling innate lymphoid regulatory cells and that these really were associated with slow growth of the till cultures. When we looked a little bit deeper, we could see that these inhibitory cells, these ILC regs, limited T cell expansion, both the helper cells and the CD4 cells, and that they also changed the production of cytokines that these T cells could make. So I didn't show this data, but they really have quite an impact on, on the biology of the T cells that are, are found in culture. We think they're in a unique lineage because they express the marker CD56, but they also express unique cytokines or the, a unique combination of cytokines, which is IL-9 and IL-22. And uh, um, these, the presence of these cells did correlate with uh, time to recurrence in ovarian cancer. How do we do? Oh, is 
good. Okay. I have a one minute sign here. <laughs> okay, so time for the question. Yes. Okay, so uh, just an overview. What we think now is really we should consider another population of regulatory cells here that I've called NK regulatory cells or innate lymphoid regulatory cells. They seem to be acting very similar to the conventional T regulatory cells. And so if everybody wants to get their phone and uh, participate in the Q&A, that would be great. And the first question is, uh, are CD8 positive T cells associated with good prognosis? And so this would be the cytotoxic T cells that are found in the tumor microenvironment. So true or false? 15 responses. Actually, I don't see what the responses are. <laughs> Not yet. Not yet. <coughs> you can ask them to stop whenever you want to. We're going for 30. Oh, yeah. 31. Okay. Yeah, go for it. <laughs> no, 32. 32. Okay. Very good. And the answer is? Don't I get to see what the votes are? <laughs> yeah, you're going to. Okay. Gonna show oh, the answer is true, but you know. <laughs> People are still voting. This, this is fun. <laughs> Oh, yeah. Should come up with the answer. 39. Yeah. Oh, there, there we go. There you go. Very good. 87%. Patients with ovarian cancer do not respond as well to PD-1 blockade compared to melanoma patients. A, true, false. Good. Audience, yeah. you've got 40 responses. 40. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Any advance on 43? Okay, so the answer is true. I went over that slide pretty quick. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I would say 15 to 20 percent. Anna can confirm, but 15 to 20 percent probably respond. I th well, it's early days. There's really not a lot of numbers. So the ballpark is around that compared to, say, 38 percent, 35 to 40 percent in melanoma. So let's talk about in immune inhibitory mechanisms. So identify immune inhibitory mechanisms that are found in the ovarian tumor microenvironment. Option A, regulatory T cells from the CD4 lineage, that's a helper lineage, conventional regulatory T cells. B, regulatory T cells from the innate lymphoid cell lineage. C, IDO, indolamine dioxygenase. D, PDL1, and E, all of the above. You guys are fast. Maybe I talk slow. <laughs> We're at 35. A lot of them are surgeons, they make quick decisions. <laughs> <laughs> or maybe this is in the book, I haven't looked in the book. <laughs> okay, so it's, it's E, all of the above. Yeah, it's not 98%, they were listening, they were so listening. See, that, see that's what, when you do a presentation right after the break, you see they're, they're all there, they've had their coffee. Excellent. So. Uh, I'd like to summarize by saying when we're thinking about ovarian cancer, I think it's going to be really fun in the next five, to five years or so, or two years, really to come up with the combination therapies. What we want to target is something like PD-1, PD PD-L1 blockade, but we got to think about this myelide-derived suppressor cells, shutting down IDO, shutting down the Tregs, and who knows what to do with the NK cells, really. Okay. Thank you very much. I think we've got time for a couple of questions. People brave enough to ask biology. Oh, here we go. Keen. Hi, thanks Hi. very much. Fantastic talk, Jessica McAlpin from Vancouver. Um, you hinted at this in the complexity of, of PD-L1 uh, assessment and thresholds and sort of got a very specific question and then a general one. Um, IHC is very plagued with challenges, do you use the Hanamishi antibody and what thresholds do you take and then just sort of your thoughts on that wide diversity in response even with, within sort of high mutational load, high PD-1 or PD-L1 um, expression and not actually having a response to immune blockade. Yes, I think that summarizes all the key issues in the field right now. And so um, I can, I'm going to answer with my hat of a scientist on. Okay, so um, I think everybody 
logistically the you would like to believe it's all about pdl1 expression and um, what's going on at the site of the tumor but i really think we don't understand this so i want to emphasize nobody thinks about the kinetics of the response right so where is pdl1 on and at what time and i showed you pictures of in the tumor microenvironment those very extreme pictures of when you have pdl1 high medium and low you can tell without, I think, pretty, pretty straightforward that the, the pharmaceutical companies, industry really wanted to peg PDL1 as a target uh, biomarker. But if you think about it, what they're defining as PDL1 positive, when you read the fine line in the papers, it's 5% of the cells can express PDL1. You know, so they had to go down to really a, a minimal, minimal cutoff to, to try and even eke out at that as a biomarker. And even at that, it's clear that the ones that express PDL1 only on 5% of the cells don't really have 100% correlation. It's nowhere near. If you actually look at the negative population, they're quite, um, they can respond very well as well. So th that just tells you we don't understand the biology of the response. We don't understand where and when PDL1 is, is being blocked and when it's important. And I know in a paper that's coming out in Nature right now, um, the answer in melanoma looks like it's within one week you can measure proliferating cells that are CD8 positive. Within one week, okay? So that means when you add, at least if, if in melanoma, if it's looking like ovarian cancer, if we can draw any parallels that way, um, the response is pretty fast. You're, you're gonna kick on whatever immune response you can within a week. If you look, I know we've got data, when we look at two weeks, it's already kind of going down a little bit. Um, so. What, what's happening at, for, for, for me in one week? It's changing the proliferation of, of the cells that are already kind of going, but they don't necessarily need to be in the tumor microenvironment. They're almost more likely to be in the periphery that, that gets kicked on, and then they find their way to the tumor microenvironment. And so why do I say that? We've done studies and we've asked the question, how long does um, it take for all the PD-1 to be saturated in the tumor microenvironment? In our hands, by the second cycle, by, so by six weeks, PD-L1, PD-1 is not saturated in the tumor microenvironment yet. It takes the third cycle before it's saturated. Okay, so just that disconnect to me means that whatever it's, whatever's going on, PD-1 goes and sticks to it and it happens within the first week and not six weeks or nine weeks later in, in the tumor. Right, so the kinetics to me smells like it's something going on in the periphery, has nothing to do with the L1 expression. L1 expression already we know it's very, very, not even a good biomarker, but people are pretending it's a good biomarker. Okay, mm -hmm. so, so that's my answer to that question. And the answer about the mutation burden was really all that I was blah blahing about on the first slide. It's really, really very, very hard to get the mutation from the tumor onto the antigen presenting cell to activate the immune response. And the people who are actually looking for mutation specific T cells have to sift through many, many T cells before they can find it. Okay, so. It, the immune system is so plastic. If you look for something, you will find it. So it's not surprising to me that you find a mutation-specific T cell, but we have to ask the question, how, what's the frequency that people are finding that? And it's like one in 10,000. It's not all the T cells in the tumor microenvironment are recognizing the mutation. It's very, very few, like 1% or less. Okay. Super quick question. Sorry, it was a small Super quick question. Super quick question. And a bit of a super quick answer. <laughs> Well, well sure. we need a super quick answer. <laughs> yeah. I don't know about the question. So what about other strategies we're using for the immune system? I mean, oncolytic viruses and I would say um, patient-specific vaccines, cancer vaccines that are coming into the hype, uh, as opposed to just a um, pharmaceutical blockade approach of, of using the immune system. Is it working through the same pathways, these, uh, these different. different pathways? Different, much different. So an oncolytic virus would actually initiate an immune response and help propagate the right tumor microenvironment to promote immunotherapy. Um, but it's all different. So, but if you ask me, it'd be very important to do PD-1 blockade plus blocking one of the inhibitory mechanisms, and I think that will go a long way. Thank you very much. That was really good.